Abba, we come together to worship you. We are coming together, coming together to worship you, to bow before you, to rejoice in you, to participate in the worship that is going on in heaven. Receive us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's celebrate together the amazing grace that allows us to do just that, worship in the presence of God. Save the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. His grace that taught my heart to fear and grace. My fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear? The hour I first believed, my chains are gone. My chains. Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion.
the great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me my name is great Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul. One with himself I cannot die My soul is purchased by his blood My life is here with Christ on high With Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God Lord, as we gather around your throne right now, we do it without any fear because of your grace. And in your grace, we confess with you before you our common confession. May it too be an offering of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the fellowship of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 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 I praise God for you. I praise God for gathering us together like this across the distances to worship him together. And make no mistake, we are worshiping together today. Togetherness is vital. It is a matter of the life or death of the worship service that we gather together to worship God. God is our audience. We gather together to worship him. You are not gathered together or individually in front of a video to watch somebody speak or to hear somebody pray. No. You are participating in the songs. You are participating in the prayer. You are participating in the listening. That listening is also worship before God. And so with that consciousness of worship, we enter in. Let's do that. And if we do that, it is truly a taste of heaven of entering into the very throne room of God. That's what the Bible allows us to understand, to think, and to by faith grasp. Trusting that you are doing that. I say that in the context of looking forward to being gathered physically in this room together soon.
soon, Lord willing. It seems like the coronavirus is dying down a bit, uh, hopefully. Praise God for that. And hopefully within a few weeks, we will be able, able to gather together in this room again. I'm praying that in October, we will be gathered together again. Would you pray for that with me? If not, we'll continue to do it this way or however the Lord opens up doors. But in as much as long, and as long as we have to worship this way, let's not get used to it. Let's not get used to it. Let's not get used to just worshiping in our pajamas and any time that we want to. No, 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 no. And even right now, the more we do not do that, the more we are intentional about the worship that we offer, the better, the better. So let's do that. Let's really miss our worship being together like this. Let's know that this is not the way the Lord has already designed it to be. And perhaps it's because we neglected his worship that we are having it taken away from us to some degree right now. Let's remember how easily it can be taken away from us. God can say no to the kind of worship that we offer. And when we get back together, let's do, by God's grace, our very best to give him the worship our great king deserves. With that in mind, Deacon Philip Shin will be singing on behalf of the worship service, and after him, our brother Curtis Lee will be praying.
Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. These have been some strange times. Pandemic is still ongoing. Hurricane Lara is striking the south, Lord. The election cycle is coming up. 2020 has been a really strange year. I pray for the victims of Hurricane Lara, those who are suffering have suffered and have yet to suffer, Lord. I pray that you would be with them in these, in their troubled times, Lord. And though we're still in the quarantine, all of us, and there doesn't seem to be any end in sight, Lord, I pray you would be with us as we worship you through our, from home. I pray that even though we are apart, even though fellowship, Fellowshipping together is so, such an important part of our faith. I pray that we would remember that above all, our, that we should love our neighbors and respect them, and in doing so, keep our distance. I pray, Lord, for your mercy and guidance through these times, and that you would bless the message that Pastor Paul has for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I praise God for the special song and for the prayer. You need to understand that the prayer and the special song play a vital role in the worship service because worship is about God. And secondarily, it is about us coming together to present ourselves to him in worship. He is the only audience. Please change your misconception about the idea of now it's time to watch the worship service. No, it is time to worship. And fitting, fitting, because these days we've been talking about heaven. In the last few weeks, I've been telling you that heaven is God and that God is love. And heaven is a world of love. It's a world of relationship. And so, as we express adoration, love, worship, through relationship, it's only right. It's only right that we should do that through relationship, I should say. So we've been talking about heaven. But we've been talking about heaven from a world of hurt. We live in a fallen world where there's a lot of pain, where there's a lot of death. All, all around us, we see it. There's a lot of futility we feel. We feel it in everything that we do. We, we live in a world plagued by loneliness, futility, and death. And so for us who live here, I thought it would be great if I could, for those of us who believe in the word of God, what does the Bible tell us about where we are headed, about heaven, about the beauty of the place to which we are going, for which we've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus? What does the Bible tell us about that? And as we meditate on that, we'll be able to take that vision, that heavenly perspective, and apply it to this fallen world. My, my thought for these, this series is not just to give you a glimpse of heaven from the outside, but to bring heaven to this side. Now, today, the question that we're going to be asking is the heavenly vocation. 
what exactly are we going to be doing in heaven? What's going on in heaven now? And what will we do in heaven forever? Okay, in Revelation chapter 4, we are given a scene of heaven. And in heaven, we find 24 elders representing the entire church of God seated around a great throne, the great throne, and angels are present as well. Starting from verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. What's going on in heaven? What is this scene about? In a word, it's worship. The angels are worshiping, the saints are worshiping, and crying out, worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive all the glory forever and ever. You deserve it. You created everything. Everything was created for you. So, it's worship. There are two things that I want to share with you today. Worship and work are what are going on in heaven. Worship and work. Let's take those two apart. Let's take those two apart. Because some of you are, are going to be thinking, as soon as I say work, work, work. I mean, I thought when we go to heaven, we rest from work. Uh, uh, Work is, I work hard at what I do, and I do, but I want it to stop one day. I don't want to feel like I've wasted my time, which I often feel like I do. I want to make a difference, but I'm not sure if I'm making any kind of a difference. And the people who are under my authority don't really listen to me. My wife don't, doesn't listen to me. My children doesn't listen, listen to me. Even my dog doesn't listen to me. Yeah, work can be frustrating on this side of, a, of, of heaven. In a fallen world, the Bible tells us that we are going to work really hard by the sweat of our brow and not have much to show for it. Yeah, it can feel futile at times. But make no mistake, heaven is not just a place of rest, even though I will speak about heavenly rest. I promise I'll bring it in. But it is also, it is also about work. Let's take those two one at a time, okay? Worship. Isaiah chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 12, Revelation all throughout, and many other places in the Bible where we are given a scene of heaven. What we are given is a scene of angels crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There is worship going on. Worship, worship, worship. Angels and saints worshiping God. That is the... Atmosphere, worship is the atmosphere of heaven and praise is the soundtrack of heaven. Okay? So I don't think I need to go elaborate on that too much, that heaven should be about worship. The Bible, the whole thing really is about worshiping God and that heaven should be about worship. Of course, it's almost a no-brainer. So enough on that for now, for biblical evidence, and I could give you so much more than these three representative passages and areas of the Bible. We just read one, of course. Now let's talk about work. Work. Now, look at the promise of 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul gives to us. If we have died with him, that's every single one of you who have trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have identified with him. His identity has become yours. His death became yours. His resurrection life and power became yours by the Holy Spirit who lives inside your heart. So if you are a Christian, you have died with him, we will also live with him. We can rest assured that we will live with him. If we endure, and you will endure, because Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, when we display that our faith is genuine by enduring to the end, we will also reign with him. Do you see that? Reign with him. You will rule with him. So there is a ruling that goes on in heaven in tandem with, in love with 
Jesus. That's what we look forward to. Okay? What will be, we be ruling? Here is an area of insight, one we'll come back to. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? Who are we going to rule over or judge, preside as judge over? Over saints and over angels, over each other. Consider a world where the, the, those in the highest positions are the humblest of all. The leaders lead by greatest servanthood. Think of a world like that. Nobody's lording it over one another. Nobody is clawing to get to the next position. Everybody is celebrating each other's success. That is the world that we are looking forward to, right? A world where we serve one another. And the only ambition is to serve one another better, serve one another more. You see? Ruling is like that. Also, the Bible says we're going to be ruling angels, as you see here. Okay? We're going to be ruling angels as well. That's clear. Now, there you say, wait a minute, Pastor Paul, uh, you're talking about ruling, about reigning. Why work? Why servanthood? Why this language of servanthood and work? Why can't we just stop at reigning and rule? Reigning and rule sounds pretty good, but now as, you, as soon as you put it to, into this idea of work, it kind of sours it for me. I like the idea of heaven as rest, but heaven as work? All right, well, now you're sounding a little bit like this guy. Remember the Lion King? The Lion King? The original Lion King had a lot of themes in there that reflected Christian understandings of the world. Now, yes, there were some pagan understandings of the world in that. If you watch any kind of cartoon, any kind of media, you're going to have the enemy's perspective coming in through all of that. You got to expect that. You got to know that. And without that, really, you're going to be headed, you're headed into a lot of trouble. We are not ignorant concerning the enemy's ways. But by God's grace... Good things get in there as well. I mean, think about Mufasa. Mufasa is a Jesus figure, isn't he? Doesn't he die for his son, Simba, who makes a foolish, foolish mistake? Yeah. So Mufasa is a Jesus figure. I'm not saying that was intentional or they planned it that way. But whenever you see a, a hero in these, in these movies that make the ultimate sacrifice, dying so that others may live, that is kind of this subconscious yearning and longing for a Jesus-like hero that pulsates in every heart, whether it's a believing heart or a non-believing heart. And if you're not a Christian today, for you to long for a hero like this, or for you to, to find it beautiful, that's understandable. Because it comes together ultimately in Jesus, and Jesus is gorgeous. All right, well, now back to this guy, Simba. Why do I mention that? Because Mufasa, when he showed him all the whole land, everywhere that the sun touches, all he could think about was, I'm going to rule it all. <laughs> I'm going to rule it all, really? And, Simba, and Mufasa has to correct Simba, tell him that ruling does not necessarily mean that you always get, to what, get what you want. And then Mufasa showed him, didn't he? Yeah. Ruling, look, ruling and reigning, in a sense, all ruling and reigning is work, isn't it? All work is ruling and reigning, whether you are driving a bus or whether you are teaching a class. Or, so th those are, are, are areas where you exercise authority in your sphere of influence. That's ruling, isn't it? That's reigning. It's work. And also work is... Even if it's like, if it's not people, when you are manipulating the keys on a, on a piano, playing piano beautifully, or playing the guitar beautifully, or professionally playing baseball, you are exercising your, exerting your influence, you are reigning for the benefit of those around you, for the benefit of those you serve, right? 
So that heavenly principle of reigning, that reigning that we will do with Jesus forever, is in the work that we do in the here and now. All right, now we're ready. Heavenly life in a fallen world. So if you take these principles and apply it to, the, to this fallen world, what does it look like? Work is worthwhile, first of all. Second, we want to work it out, work out our problems. And third, worship is heavenly. Let's take these one at a time. Work is worthwhile. Three W's. Work is worthwhile. Look at this. His master said to him, well done. Jesus is talking about the end time, the judgment day, when we see Jesus face to face, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I want to tell you today, whatever your calling is in the Bible, let there be no doubt, the Bible calls your work a calling. Whatever the Lord has sovereignly placed, wherever the Lord has sovereignly placed you, the work that God has given to you, if it can be a benefit to society, to your fellow men, and especially to your brothers and sisters, it is a God-given calling. The Puritans like to say things like, I am a God-ordained plumber. Well, you are a God-ordained guitar player, a God-ordained student, a God-ordained janitor, a God-ordained president. God-ordained. And to understand your calling as a calling by God for which you will be held accountable, and if you are seen to be faithful, you will be given charge of much more. Everything that we do in this life is a little thing. See? You have been faithful over a little. No matter whether you have been the janitor, which there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, if that's God's calling, right? Or the bus driver, or the school teacher, or the president of the United States. You have been, you have been faithful over the little thing of being the president of the United States. Now, I will set you over much. You see? These little things that we are in charge of have great significance. So understand that. See your calling as a worthwhile calling, as a heavenly calling. Are you going to be a teacher? Be a heavenly teacher. Teach with heaven in view. Everything you do can be done for the glory of God. Do you find it frustrating to care for your children? Consider motherhood, consider fatherhood a heavenly calling. Even from just this world stage, people carry out campaigns on the value of fatherhood. How much more when you realize these children don't ultimately belong to you? They are not ultimately your responsibility, but God's responsibility whom he has placed into your care and as his steward. You are given the opportunity to invest in all of eternity in the lives of these precious ones. Do you see your children that way? Do you see your loved ones, your parents, your friends this way? Whomever you serve in whatever vocation you have, do it with heaven in view. Do it with eternity in mind. And when you do it with that kind of a mentality, you can give so much more. You can be, you can be unstoppable in what it, what pursuing excellence. You really have a reason to pursue excellence in whatever you do. Even though it may seem very mundane and futile to others, to you it doesn't have to be. The smallest thing can be done for eternal glory because God has called you to it. Do it with that kind of understanding. Your job has eternal, heavenly value. When you do your work and it gets hard, just remember that you're practicing for heaven. You're practicing for heaven. You know, when I live and when we do what I do in this life, sometimes it feels like I'm exercising with these weights on. 
These way, when we think about the sin that is in the world and all the things that we have to combat societally, individually, attacks from the outside, attacks from the inside, and so hard to keep ourselves pure before God, it's like exercising with these weights on. But once in a while, the weights seem to come off, and I feel like I can run so fast. May God give you many, many moments like that where you feel the sin just trip off and and you see who you really are in Jesus. And you get a taste of the freedom that's to come and that is your birthright in him. So, whatever obstacles Satan throws in your way, remember that God has called you to your work and persevere, persevere, pursue excellence. The child of God really has a reason to pursue excellence in every vocation because every vocation, every God-honoring vocation has heavenly worth to it. Work is worthwhile. Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. You can look it up. I'm not lying. Also, we should work it out. We should work it out on this side of heaven. Why? Because that's our job, to work it out. That's what it means to reign. It is to rule. And to work things out, work out problems and issues, to care, care for others. Look, they were, they were having trouble in this church in Corinth. There were, there were people inside. The members were suing one another. We're going to the public law courts to sue each other. And I already quoted this in this sermon, but look at it more in context. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to judge the most trivial cases? Remember the small things? Everything on this heaven is a small thing. You cannot handle a small thing when you'll be judging the world. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? The Apostle Paul says, remember who you are. I look at passages like this and I'm kind of ashamed. Because we see a lot of churches, and I'm not going to say that our church is, is going to be exempt from this. I'm speaking from personal experience. So many churches, church members taking each other to law courts. There's a church that I care about deeply that ended up, used to boast how they're free from these kinds of problems, but ended up in a very ugly legal battle. This elder took the church to court, sued the church. At first, I didn't know which side was right or wrong, but as soon as the elder took it to the law court, I, I said, okay, uh, that, that's just, he just went, went, that's where he crossed the line. That's what I saw at that time, and I still hold to that position. I asked the elder's brother, because again, it's a, it's a situation close to my heart. I asked that elder's brother, how could he, I know he had problems with the church, but how could he take it to the law courts? It's against the scriptures. And this elder's brother, who was also in the, uh, training for ministry, he said, put, your, put your, for yourself in my brother, the elder's shoes. He's a businessman. Put yourself in his shoes. How else would you respond? That's what he said. But you see, that's the problem. He's responding as a businessman. That's the issue. We are not to treat each other as a business. This is not a business. The church is not a business. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the family of God. It's because we don't understand membership, the value of membership in the body of Jesus Christ, that we are so quick. I'm not saying that there's no place for the legal legal, um, for the civics, um, for the courts in the life of the church. But whenever church members take church members to court, it is a failure. It is a failure. It's a last resort. And it is a tragedy. And it's something that we need to repent of and grow from, not celebrate the victories. I, I know. It's a personal issue for me. But I think it's something that we can learn from. You know, I look at situations like that, and again, I think of the Lion King. 
<laughs> this is a scene where Simba now, growing up under a truckload of guilt, has this vision of his father. His father comes to him in the clouds and says, look inside yourself. And I like the next lines better. You are so much more than what you have become. Church members taking other church members to court hear this. I feel like the Lord would say, you are so much more. I've called you to be and you are so much more than what you have become. Then the church splits. Then the laughing stock of the world you have become. And this is not just um, unique to our world, our church, today's church. It was happening in the Bible too. God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That could be said of that church. It could be said of the churches around us. It could be said of this church. Let's understand who we are. Let's understand that we are a community of, a, of heaven on earth. We are the heavenly family on earth. And let's work it out on this side of heaven, within the walls of the church, when we have problems, when we have issues, as we will. Let membership matter. You see, the local church membership doesn't really matter today. That's a big problem. If the local church is the most visible expression of the heavenly community, the membership in the church should matter. It should bother you if you're going to have to have tension within a local church. You shouldn't say, if I just avoid these people, that will resolve my problem. There are so many other churches in the city. No, no. Membership matters. Membership matters. I pray that you would change your mindset if it needs to be changed. All of us, we could do better in this. Let's really see each other as, other as members of the body of Jesus for which we are accountable. And, at, and if at all possible, let's do the best that we can to resolve our issues in-house. Worship, because worship ultimately is worth it because it's heavenly. Heavenly. Right here in Hebrews chapter 12, it speaks of the gathered worship. When the church gathers together to worship, you have come to Mount Zion, which is another word for heaven, to the city of the living God, to angels, to saints, to the forgiving, accepting, receiving, embracing blood of Jesus. Yes, I, I that was my hyperbole. If you could actually exaggerate any of this, you really can't. You really can't. Read the whole passage for yourself. It's fantastic. What is it about when we come together, when we gather together? When we gather together across the distances or when we gather together in a better form in this room, it is about worshiping in the heavenly places. It is about bringing heaven down into this room. No, better yet, we are taking this room and entering into heaven itself. That's the language of the scriptures. That's the language of the scriptures where we worship together. When we do, we are entering into the worship and the praise. The angels, the thousands, the, the, the millions of angels gather together around King Jesus. The, the saints falling before the throne saying, Jesus, you are worthy, you are worthy. Your love will not be able to be fathomed in all the millennia to come. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Among the saints you will find your fathers, your mothers, your brothers, your sisters, your children who have already gone to be with the Lord. And it, along with them we are worshiping in symphony and concert before our King Jesus. This is what's going on right now when we worship. Is that how you see it? Is that how you value our Lord's Day worship service? It should be. Is that how we prioritize it? It seems to me, and let me say this as lovingly as I possibly can, we allow a lot of us, a lot of us allow everything to get in the way 
of our Lord's Day worship. We let play get in the way of Lord's Day worship. We let work get in the way of Lord's Day worship. Yes, work can be worship, but if you don't get worship worship right, then you can't get work worship right, can you? It doesn't really make any sense. Worshiping together on the Lord's Day is the most pristine sample of heaven that we have on earth. I'll say it again. Worship on the Lord's Day as we gather together is the most, most pristine, pristine sample of heaven we have on earth. Let's value it as it is. Let's schedule it for that purpose. Let's prioritize it. Let's think again when something else... You see, the thing is right now, we have been given so much flexibility and in some ways it serves our purposes. And I, I want to encourage you, yeah, during the week... Use whatever resources you have. But how will the Lord lead you and listen to his voice to prioritize this worship where we, co- where we, have come, to, we, where we come together? How, how will that be expressed? I want to encourage you to think about that and meditate on it. I, want, I don't want to be legalistic and give you all kinds of boundaries or or exact things, pray, process it before the Lord. How will you prioritize worship with your brothers and sisters before God? And in this way, really celebrate the taste of heaven before it's time. Jesus has given us this. Jesus has given us this to come together into heaven itself. Individual worship is great, but it's not this. Yes, that's a taste of heaven before it's time too, but it's not this. So loved ones, let's celebrate King Jesus together. And let's prioritize celebrating him together. Seeing that heaven is about worship and work, let's prioritize heaven on earth. Let's pray. King Jesus, Lord, I love my brothers and sisters. And I am greedy that they get worship right. Lord, if they heard a condemning tone in my voice, King Jesus, they're wrong. You know my heart, I'm not condemning them. But let it be a calling from you to draw them closer into you along with me that we might as a community of heaven be drawn closer to the heart of heaven, King Jesus, that you are. And getting that feel of heaven on your day, the day that we get to set aside for worship, Let us take and invade this world with heaven. Give us the power, give us the joy to do it. Let us invade our work with heaven. I pray that every vocation that my brothers and sisters are doing, all the ones that have taken, that have been reshaped into forms that they never thought that they were buying into when they first took the jobs, I pray that you would give my brothers and sisters a fresh sense of calling as mothers, as teachers, as leaders in their own right, wherever their sphere of influence reigning might be. You receive all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. This next song, among the modern hymns is one that truly, truly lifts up the name of Jesus. And so let's do that with our hearts fully engaged. Let's offer this song of worship to the Lord with the mentality, the mindset of participating in the worship that we will be offering to the Lord forever. Let's lift up His name. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, 
Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light as darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? All will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age. He stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, the Father, Spirit, Son, Lion and the Lamb, Lion and this worship service. Lord, we want to give full vent and expression to the worship of our hearts, a love that you have planted in our hearts. We want to give it full vent, full expression. And Lord, we know that that is ultimately reserved for the day when we are with you face to face. But even now, as we have sung your praise and entered into your worship, we know that in the spiritual realm, in the ultimate reality, we are singing before your throne. And we are not away from you. You are closer than our very breath. 
and in your presence lord my brothers and sisters and i we've offered our offering today we pray lord god that along with our lives that you would receive our offerings and use them for your glory especially in these very strange times and you receive all the glory we pray amen our father which art in heaven our love be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who even now sits upon the throne, the unending, unfathomable love of God the Father Almighty, the conviction, the fellowship, the presence, the oneness of the Holy Spirit, be upon every child of God within the sound of my voice, be upon them both now and forevermore, for Jesus' sake and glory. Amen. Blessed Lord's Day.